All right. Welcome everyone to the next exciting keynote presentation for Neuromatch Conference 4. Uh, today I have the distinct pleasure of hosting the session of our, of our next uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Vivek Jayaraman from the Janelia Research Campus and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, Vivek is a senior group leader at Janelia as well as the head of the mechanistic cognitive neuroscience um, effort at Janelia. Um, so, so um, I, I, I've I've uh, I've I've known uh, Vivek and, and his work for many years, and I think one of the the, the more impressive things uh, to me about his work has been his tireless efforts to try to understand how flies um, uh, represent the external world in internal representations, which is something that he's going to tell you a little bit more about today. Um, so, for example, for when I was a graduate student, um, we had played with these toy models of, uh, of ring attractors as ways of keeping track of head directions and, and where one is in the whole world. And there were these really beautiful mathematical theories and models of, of how this could possibly work. And so it was with astonishment, I think we all had a, coll a collective gasp in the community when we saw these beautiful ring attractors, not only in mathematical theory, but in reality, in the fly brain as a ring of neurons, um, as in the picture on the right hand side in the next slide. Um, and so, so we were really delighted to have him here today. Um, and this is a reminder that for everyone watching that you can feel free to type into the chat on the right hand side. And there is a separate button on the bottom that's labeled ask a question where you may ask your questions um, and I'll curate and moderate at the very end. You can also upvote each other's questions if you see someone else's question that you find to be comp particularly compelling and it'll, it'll help it rise to the top of the list. So without for further ado, I'm gonna hand over, uh, I'm gonna hand over the mic to Vivek. Thanks so much, Bing. And uh, thank you to the all, all the organizers for inviting me to this. So I should confess, I'm one of those people who really likes in-person talks, the closed loop interactions so much more than Zoom and Crowdcast talks. Um, but if there's anything that you know should make those of us who hold these ancient views change our minds, it's something like Neuromatch. So to me, it's a real pleasure to be here and to be able to communicate with such a large community. So um, yeah, I welcome your questions at the end. So please do keep them coming. All right, so as Bing said, uh, today I'll be talking a little bit about internal representations uh, in the fly, how they're built, uh, how they're used, or at least you know what we know of how they're used, um, and essentially the kinds of operations that they enable. Largely, it's going to be a structure function talk, and in many minds, I think hardwired tends to correlate with like a very well-defined reflexive behavior. And I'm going to talk about um, how hardwired can actually be a wonderful way to do flexible behavior. So. I think it's a misconception that I had uh, years ago uh, myself that that should be gotten rid of. All right, so if I'm gonna talk about flexible navigation, I feel I should define that for you uh, for in the way that I'm gonna use it. I'll start by talking about inflexible navigation. And so this is maybe one of my all time favorite little books. Uh, it's Valentino Breitenberg's vehicles book from which I, I took this. So he has these simple little vehicles where there's two sensors um, at the top, and they could be sensors of light, for example, and they're hooked up to two motors that maybe just, you know, essentially, depending on what the sensor is, you can kind of have a transfer function that just says linearly, uh, you know, sensor more active, that particular motor that it's connected to more active, or you can have them be inhibitory or, you know, whatever you want, whatever kind of function you want. And the magic of this book is that with just simple wiring and different kinds of connections, you can get these little vehicles to do quite complex things or complex looking things. And so essentially you can get them, for example, if you have a stimulus right in front, so let's say a bright spot or something, uh, this kind of the, the vehicle 2B on the left will tend to orient towards it, will tend to approach it. Whereas the vehicle to the right is gonna tend to avoid it just because of the wiring and the fact that all you have is two sensors and two motors, okay? But um, now imagine that you have a different situation where there was something at a particular location, but then it vanished. And let's say that the vehicle has to wait, not, not just start off immediately when it sees the thing, but after it's vanished, kind of hold that in memory and, and move towards it. The simple wiring scheme doesn't work there. And basically what you end up needing is something internal that keeps track of where something was and so that it can be used to actually move towards it. You can complicate the situation a little bit more and say, well, what if there are many different kinds of uh, attractive objects or cues in the world, not necessarily attractive objects, and the place that you need to go is 
just one spot that has a particular location relative to them. And that spot can move around depending on the situation. So you need the vehicle to be trainable. Well, again, you're demanding quite a bit of an internal representation, something that either maps the uh, situation, converts it into something that the motor system of this vehicle can use or so on. You could make it even more um, you know, goal-driven in an explicit sense by saying, well, maybe you had a path earlier, but now there's an obstacle and I still need to get to this location that I, again, don't have a direct sensory input telling me that there's a location. So this kind of flexibility, as you push this, you push into the realm of having more and more internal representation driven behaviors. And so an example of which is, you know, you have something like a head direction cell where depending on which direction your head is pointed, uh, these cells are active. And so Jeff Tobey discovered these originally in rodents. They're found in many other systems besides. Interestingly, uh, recent work on the AI side, on the ma machine learning side suggests that, well, with some tweaking admittedly, um, even artificial neural networks, not just uh, the ones you find inside uh, animals, um, if you're trying to solve navigation tasks and if you, you know, your objective function says something about flexible navigation, well, it's handy to have these sorts of internal representations in artificial neural networks as well. And so in some ways, uh, you know, there's a certain basic requirement if you have an, a neural representation of this sort, neural dynamics of this sort, which persist, um, which are sort of multimodal, they, are, they have a certain level of abstraction associated with them. And so typically these kinds of things are thought to require recurrent neural networks to support them. So you have densely recurrent networks or particular kinds of recurrent networks like the kind uh, being mentioned earlier, like a ring attractor, and often they look messy. And so one of the challenges that people tend to confront is, well, how do you take something like this and figure out how the computation was actually performed? Do you even want to do, approach that problem? Or should you just stop and say, well, you know, we had a certain objective function for the network. We tried some learning rule. The network seemed to have some representations that look roughly like they should solve the task. We're done. Uh, I think that the that's a little bit too quick for me. Uh, I think that one can approach these answers, uh, these questions, and get answers to them. It's just you need certain tools. And so my case for you today is going to be that with enough information about cell types, however you define them, some practical way, and about structure. You can really get pretty satisfying answers to how you generate certain kinds of activity patterns, even complex ones that are associated with cognitive variables and cognitive processes. And so when you go to that, there's a tendency, I feel, uh, sometimes to, to kind of rely on uh, fairly old fashioned views of how cognition might be, uh, you know, kind of like the old ideas of evolution with sort of humans at the top and man and particularly at the top and, and you know, uh, chimpanzees and so on down below and then, you know, way down below somewhere uh, down this thing, you have insects. And so, you know, they're like, whatever. Um, except I think that same thinking sort of persists in, in when people think about cognition. Insects are small and, you know, you, they're easy to ignore perhaps or to swat, uh, not that easy to swat sometimes. Um, and, and you think, well, you know, insects, how can they be useful to tell you about cognition? Except for those of you who know about bees or ants, um, I mean, bees are my favorite, they can do some insanely complicated things and I'm still waiting for a rodent to tell its friend rodent where there's a really good source of food and have the friend understand and kind of make its way there. So, you know, I think bees have things that are pretty amazing. Uh, you may not think of the fly the same way, but there's a reason why I bring the fly in because of course the system has just fantastic genetic tools. So in addition to being a small system that is actually quite tractable um, and having identified neurons that you can kind of target genetically, uh, we can actually target them genetically because of the tools in the fly. And so a lot of our work is built on decades of just beautiful work from a very large number of labs, uh, you know, characterizing different kinds of genotypes of flies or, uh, and characterizing them exhaustively with anatomy and so on and so forth. And what we benefit from is in addition to the fact that these uh, flies have lovely tools to work with, this is an insect that can actually navigate pretty flexibly in the world. So it's not a bee, you won't be confused with one any day soon. However, um, I'll give you a simple example. This is a fly that basically this, what you're seeing is a trajectory where the fly is making its way to a spot of food. It's a very tiny spot of food, just microliters of food. Uh, and it's a pitch dark arena. So it's doing this in darkness, which is why it's wandering about a lot, uh, eventually finds its way to the food. It's starved for 24 to 48 hours, depending. Um, what Hanna and other people have reported as well, so originally Michael Dickinson's lab and Axel Brockman's lab reported this, 
Um, but in a beautiful set of experiments, what Hana is seeing is these gorgeous trajectories that a fly can make in darkness. When the food is sort of running low, it's eaten a little bit, it starts exploring. And it makes these lovely little loops coming back to that central spot. Okay, so again, it's in darkness. We can do these experiments with flies that have their olfactory receptors knocked out, so it's not an olfactory cue. Essentially, flies are somehow keeping track of um, presumably their direction and distance in some form enough to come back. It's not the classic path integrating ant of Rudiger Weiner, which sort of goes off on a long hundreds of meters, uh, may even a trajectory, and you know makes its way directly back to its nest. But it is doing some form of uh, keeping track of direction and distance. And that involves, again, an internal variable. You're keeping track of your self-motion when you're doing this in darkness. In addition, uh, Michael Reiser, my colleague here at Junelia, has shown that flies can do a form of uh, the Morris water maze, so essentially using a thermal arena instead of a, a pool, which tends to be a very short experiment with flies if you use water. Uh, what he does is he has a little cool spot and he has a hot floor in there. And so when Tyler Rostad, this grad student, amazing grad student in Michael Reiser and Charles Zucker's lab, did these experiments, he had the flies in a virtual reality arena with busy visual patterns on the arena. And then in a few minutes, the fly would learn from trial to trial if the cold spot, the one hospitable spot in this otherwise inhospitable environment, if that moved around in a way that was in sync with the visual cues, then when you got to the probe trial, the fly would first explore um, the, the, the area of this arena, which was associated with safety, with this cool spot. And, and basically there was no cool spot in the probe trial. It was just all hot, but the fly would go there. And this is very quick learning. So flies can clearly do some form of, they, they use a spatial memory of some sort. In addition, in uh, experiments that first began in the 90s in Martin Heisenberg's lab, but that we've recently replicated, uh, Chuntao Dan in my lab, in particular working in close collaboration with the theorist here, my colleague Anne Hermanstead. Uh, what we've found is that flies can indeed learn also in one dimension. So essentially, if all you need to train them on is some part of the visual world is bad and some other part is good, uh, and you train them with a laser on their butts, essentially, they very quickly learn to avoid the parts that are, and by very quickly, I mean in minutes, just a couple of minutes, they're already changing the behavior. In five minutes, they're, they're kind of learning things quite well, and they start avoiding one part of the visual scene and kind of hang out near the, near the safer part, as represented by these increasing uh, residencies in particular parts of the heading space in this arena. All right, so hopefully you're convinced that flies have some flexibility in behavior and they can use potentially internal representations to carry that out. But flies are different from uh, kind of an artificial neural network in one key respect. Like all other animals, they also have to respect biomechanical constraints. And so what does that mean? Well, the coordinate system that they're actually getting the information in, well, let's say if it's visual information, that's located, I mean, you're talking about things coming into their eyes on their head. The head can move about, swivel about uh, freely, uh, as Eugenia and others have shown in experiments uh, monitoring fly movements. Eugenia Kiape, uh, who's at Champalimo, has shown in experiments where they monitored the fly's head movements. So essentially, when the fly is trying to do some insanely crazy thing, like crossing this gap over here, its body is moving, its head is pitching, uh, and yet it has to push its legs out to the right places on a precarious ledge to kind of make it to the other side. So it has to do some coordinate transformations internally to be able to do that, just as you would have to if you kind of moved your head about and had to reach, had to make a reach in some particular direction. You have to convert from your retinal coordinates to uh, something that your arm can use. All right, so what we have then is a system which presumably needs uh, internal representations to keep track of direction, distance, and so on, uh, but also needs some kind of um, ability to convert from one coordinate system to another. And so this creates an opportunity for those of us who are interested in kind of getting to the circuit basis of interesting behaviors like this um, to actually plumb the depths of how this might be done using everything that the fly uh, brings to you. So the most recent addition to the toolkit uh, is a full connectome. And so this is something um, we're still actually, the full connectome is still coming. It's maybe two years away or a year away, depending on um, you know, how things go. But what we started out with was something called the Hemibrain Connectome. And this was a joint collaborative project between Janelia's Fly EM group um, with Google uh, kind of providing some of the computational muscle, although some of the computation was done also at Janelia. And so what this achieved was essentially a, a, not just 
kind of images of um, high resolution where you could track synapses and annotate synapses between neurons, but literally the wiring diagram with identities for the best approximation we had them of a huge number of neurons, 21,000 in this particular case, of which about 3,000 are in a particular brain structure that my lab cares a lot about called the central complex. So this is a brain structure that is actually um, highly involved in many of the behaviors I just showed you, these flexible behaviors. And it's thought to be involved in much more than just that, but I'm gonna focus on the flexible navigation aspects in this talk. And so um, the, much of the uh, connectomic work I'm gonna tell you about was done by four just spectacular uh, folks in my lab, Brad Hulls, Hannah Haberkern, Roma Franconville, and Dan Turner Evans. Um, and so there were many others involved in this project, I'm going to focus on just these folks' um, uh, work in the central complex. And so let me tell you a little bit about the central complex. So it's this uh, brain region that's composed of many different substructures. So there's this funky shaped thing called the protocerebral bridge that's like a shape like a handlebar mustache. Uh, there's this thing called the fan shaped body, uh, shaped like a fan, ellipsoid body, which is this uh, donut shaped structure, uh, and the paired noduli, these little things down here. And the cool thing about uh, these structures is neuron after neuron that arborizes in these things respect certain boundaries even within these structures. So the different structures, there's particular neuron types that you can identify that go from place to place to place in these structures in very stereotyped ways. And what's magical still is this is conserved across insects. So bees have it, ants have it, a whole bunch of other insects, as Stanley Heinze pointed out in uh, this paper, have it. And so it's been studied in many different insects. It's been studied originally, uh, I'd say, in the locust by Uwe Holmberg and others with physiology. Uh, the anatomy has been studied for a lot longer than that by Nick Strasswell and others. It's been studied in dung beetles, in butterflies, monarch butterflies that do crazy navigation over thousands of kilometers. It's been studied in cockroaches by Roy Richmond's lab. So this is a structure that's conserved, I mean, a brain region that's conserved in much the same way across all these insects and even some crustaceans. Um, what we look at it as though is an opportunity to get to implementation level understanding of what I would say are cognitive building blocks, internal representations, vector computations, things of that nature. And so that's the kind of thing that I'm going to make a case to you about. Um, you can in this network divide up different pieces of it in some sort of modules where you have input modules can communicating things, information like optic flow or motion cues of different sorts, um, self motion signals that consolidate optic flow as well as efference or proprioceptive information, pass that on to a compass network like a head direction network, which we think is uh, like a ring attractor network. And so these different little modules, this is significant because this is not some random network that just anything's anything and the weights don't tell you anything. I mean, this is something where it's a, a network that you could say in some ways is a fully trained deep recurrent neural network specifically for flexible navigation. So it's, does, it's not hardwired in the sense that, oh, there's no plasticity, you can't learn anything, but the construction, the architecture makes it really easy to learn things rapidly. And so that's what I think is really cool about the system and also offers general insights for those trying to understand these kinds of computations in other systems, even ones that have fur or hair or you know, seem a lot larger. And so I can sketch for you something that sort of looks like a um, neural network, uh, diagram, artificial neural network thing, where there's like a feed forward sort of motif, there's recurrent uh, connectivity between different types of neurons, which have some name here. These are, by the way, neuron types, not neurons. Uh, and then there's feedback. So, you know, you can, it has all the fixins. It has everything that you'd expect in a network that maybe does uh, internal representation driven navigation. But what's interesting here is, uh, I, in these cases, these guys have names because we kind of know what types they are. We have some reason to believe they are particular types of neurons. And in fact, in that little messy looking spaghetti and meatball thing that I showed you early on, we actually know something about these neurons, not just who they're connected to and so on, but their properties in multiple ways and the fact that they can be distinguished as types. And that gives us extremely important information when it comes to figuring out how they compute what they compute. Um, and that's what I'm, I'm going to kind of focus on the rest of the way. Again, in this thing, this entire network, um, this is a small subset of the full complexity of the central complex. So this is just a little, a few cell types just for you to get a sense of this area. Uh, and in each of these is a cell type uh, within which there's many, many individual neurons, okay, hundreds of them. So the star of our show is going to be the so-called EPG neurons, the ones that are uh, in pink here. 
And each of these neurons sends its arbors. So we won't get into the cell bodies and so on yet, because in uh, invertebrates, a lot of the computation anyway happens in the processes. Um, and so what you're going to see here is uh, these different colors represent the arbors of individual EPG neurons, which are all next to each other in, arranged in this donut-shaped structure called the ellipsoid body. And what we're going to track now is the population activity of this particular EPG population um, as the fly is walking on a ball in pitch darkness. And so this was Johannes Selig, a stellar postdoc in my lab at the time, and now a, a Max Planck group leader in Bonn. Uh, his work and what he showed was in pitch darkness, when the fly moved, if you tracked uh, the population vector average of this signal of the EPG population, while you also track the accumulated ball rotation in blue here, you could get really good matches between them for long periods. Eventually, drift gets in there. Um, if you were wandering about in a dark room or blindfolded, you, you get lost pretty quickly. Or you, you fail to keep track of your own movements at some point. So of course, the fly as well and the fly's compass eventually loses track. But this head direction representation is pretty potent and, and you know uh, also persists when the fly is standing still. So it, it outlasts the fly's kind of standing still and resumes in the right place, even if it starts to die down, as measured by GCAMP uh, activity in this particular case. And so, of course, as Bing mentioned, um, the interpretation of this activity came quite easily to us to, you know, brought to mind, um, well, maybe a ring attractor network underlies this sort of activity pattern, because indeed, based on decades of work, uh, theory work, um, you know, Haim Sampolinsky, Ketchen Zhang, Bruce McNaughton's lab, uh, and, and others, there were these gorgeous models of ring attractors where you could take a bump of activity and I'm you know just showing the bump of activity would be like slicing through this donut and linearizing it you'd get kind of a bump of activity that's moving around and what we we use that as inspiration for a theory experiment collaboration that was very successful for us um, to, to try and get at how close an implementation really it was in, in the fly a brain to a ring attractor network something that Dan Turner Evans pursued also at an even more detailed level uh, subsequently. And so uh, we think this is a pretty good model for what's actually going on in the fly brain. But I want to focus on one particular aspect uh, because it's going to come up again later, which is, well, fine, you have a ring attractor based model is how, how literal is it? Like, how does the flies uh, ring attractor in this case uh, update when when the fly turns how does this bump move around the ring when the fly turns in darkness you know the self motion input coming in well it turns out that it's almost exactly as uh, skaggs and mcnaughton sketched or as uh, sebastian sung and richard handloser in a model had or as sketch and zhang had uh, in a model you have these side rings basically you have one population of neurons these are the epg neurons that i'm showing here they send projections up to a different structure this thing that i call the protocerebral bridge uh, earlier i introduced to you um, and so there's two bumps now going up, slightly phase shifted relative to each other, going up to a different structure, uh, this protocerebral proto bridge, where there are a different set of neurons called PEN neurons. The names aren't relevant. What I want you to focus on is that in this exact compartment of the protocerebral bridge, where this, e this EPG neuron goes off and, and kind of has, has its outputs, this particular PEN neuron gets its inputs there but then when it projects back, it projects back to the side of the location that it got its inputs. So you'll see the red PEN neuron is basically to the to clockwise of um, the blue EPG neuron that it's getting its input from. And the fact that it's getting its inputs, we know from electron microscopy, from functional connectivity experiments and so on. Um, and then similarly, on the other side, you have an EPG neuron going up. So there's a bump going up there. The PEN neuron presumably inherits some form of that bump. But then when it comes back, the projection pattern is to the other side, to the anti-counterclockwise side of the original EPG input. And so as many of you can imagine this, uh, and as perhaps most of you know from ring attractor models, uh, this sets up literally uh, kind of like as a theorist dream, something where if all you have is like, all you need is essentially differential velocity input. Suppose you said uh, this side, these PNs, the red PNs respond in a way that's linearly correlated with uh, the fly's turning velocity when it turns counterclockwise and the blue ones when it turns clockwise. Well, as long as that translates to asymmetries between the red and the blue PEN neurons, this conjunctive coding of heading and angular velocity allow you to shift a bump of activity that starts out in the middle to either one side or the other side. 
And the same logic, the same network motif of the phase shift coming either this way or that way, using the bridge as the split uh, and going one way or the other, allows you to essentially get an entire compass with the bump moving all the way around if the fly is turning one way and all the way because of the asymmetry in one direction and all the way the other way because again, the bump is yanked down all the way uh, around the ring the other way. So this, this kind of computation where essentially you have two bumps and depending on their scaling, you have essentially the original bump, which comes from the EPG neurons in the ellipsoid body, and you have a bump on the side, which is coming from these PEN neurons being asymmetrically excited, dragging, you do some kind of computation where the bump math leads to a new bump uh, that's shifted. So that's in darkness. If you stick the fly in a visual setting as Johannes then did, well, it turns out the bump is even more accurate uh, and, and the vi visual setting doesn't have to be a very simple visual setting. It can have a complex pattern on there, the patterns around the fly and it's kind of doing its thing. And as you can see, the bump of activity represented here uh, by activity in GCAMP mode, uh, so it's calcium sensors again in that population of neurons, you can see it's tracking really well the fly's heading. And so um, what you get then is a new puzzle, which is, how do you take different surroundings and map them onto this single head direction representation, this internal representation that abstracts over darkness, uh, you know, as well as different kinds of visual settings? And so this is something, again, we explored with uh, our theory colleagues and Hermannstedt, Sandro Romani, and also Larry Abbott, who's a Janelia scholar and uh, works out of Columbia. Um, and so basically what we realized is that um, the key to the puzzle was these so-called ring neurons that carry visual information. And the connectome allows us to actually look at these neurons. So they get visual information from the eyes. They come in, the synapses onto these uh, ring neurons, the blue neuron being one of those ring neurons, synapses onto an EPG neuron, which is one of these yellow neurons that you're seeing here. And this ring neuron you'll notice goes all the way around the ellipsoid body. So there's visual feature information coming in and there's a ton of it coming in from different ring neurons as you can see here. And each ring neuron is making synapses we know onto every single EPG neuron. So EPG neurons are kind of, uh, you know, doing this wedge-shaped arborization. The ring neurons are arborizing throughout the ellipsoid body and it's an all-to-all -all mapping. And so if we were to look at one particular uh, pair of neurons, you, let's say that you have a pink um, compass neuron and you have a green EPG, uh, green uh, ring neuron. So let's say this is the green ring neuron that goes all the way around the ellipsoid body. The pink is the compass neuron. And remember, these green neurons are carrying some kind of visual information. Well, if you have a pixel where the intensity represents a synaptic weight, um, I can draw you a little vector which says this is the compass neuron's weight from this ring neuron, and this is the weight from another ring neuron. And I can fill out that matrix and say, well, if I have these two uh, EPG neurons, these uh, so-called compass or head direction cells, I can tell you, I can read off the synaptic weight from different populations of, um, from different types of ring neurons. I can put this on this matrix. But now imagine that you want to map some visual scene onto this compass. So what does mapping it mean? In that visual scene, when the fly turns around, the bump of activity should move exactly in the right way so that 360 degrees is really 360 degrees. How do you do that? Well, um, if you take two ring neurons, in this case, let's say the purple and the green one, which are the vertical uh, columns here, let's say one ring neuron happens to like uh, visual features. I'm using a simple cell-like representation here. Uh, in this part of the visual field, the other one over there, if you imagine a full map of them um, where the ring neurons are arranged based on their visual fields being from uh, one end to the other of the visual setting, what you should get, and you can work this out quickly, is if the mapping is perfect, you should get these diagonals running through it. Essentially one diagonal, if this, there's a single bar in the visual field of the fly or in the visual scene of the fly, then what you should get if you want a perfect head direction mapping is essentially a mapping of weights such that the ring neurons to the compass neuron weights give you a diagonal, okay? So those weights should transform. And we thought Hebbian rules are a good way to get such a transformation. Essentially, we already know that the bump of activity can be moved by self motion information. So the fly, let's say turns 30 degrees, the bump moves to the right place in the ellipsoid body. But now there's a visual scene uh, that the fly is moving in and so the visual bar has now moved relative to the fly and a different set of ring neurons are activated. Well, if they are co-activated whenever the bump is at a particular place in the EPG neuron population, that co-activity and some sort of Hebbian rule should be enough to give you, if you strengthen or weaken weights based on that, you should be able to get this mapping. So that's what we conjectured. Sangsu actually tried the experiment using optogenetics. What did he do? 
first, I mean, this was done in a flying fly at very low light intensity, uh, laser intensity, to uh, for reasons that will become clear shortly. But in this case, the original mapping, the, the normal mapping of the fly uh, uh, compass system is, well, when things move clockwise, when the visual world moves clockwise, the bump of activity follows through and moves clockwise. In this case, we're using a simple scene just to keep it really simple. And so counterclockwise movements mean the compass moves counterclockwise. What Sang Su did um, was to essentially artificially with optogenetics selectively stimulate different EPG neurons while moving the visual stimulus in this case in exactly the opposite direction. So in other words, it's like saying the world's rules are twisted around and when you move your head right, instead of the world moving to the left, he forced the world to be to the right, okay? So he's basically using optogenetics, forcing the bump against its will. As you can see, the bump kind of wants to track the visual stimulus, but he optogenetically with CS Crimson uh, activates it in particular ways so that the bump is now moving counter to the rotation of the visual stripe. He does this for five minutes. The, you know, the bump unwillingly goes there because the self motion is telling it to go the other way. Um, and the visual cue is its original mapping is telling it to go the other way as well. But eventually after five minutes of this, when he exposes the fly to the visual setting again, it's basically an inverted mapping. So when the bar is moving clockwise, um, the bump of activity is moving counterclockwise and vice versa. And so you can check the paper for the full details on this. This is the most extreme version. There were loads of other more normal experiments, but this was kind of a fun one, which just shows how powerful the flexibility there is uh, in terms of you know, how much the compass can tolerate. All right, so, so basically what you have then is a set of neurons that are connected all to all um, between the inhibitory ring neurons that bring in visual feature information and the compass neurons um, that basically comprise these head direction cells. And uh, what I'm telling you is that there's uh, flexibility in, the, in this mapping and some kind of Hebbian rule can give you the kind of mapping you want to map a visual scene onto uh, the compass. In addition to visual scenes though, uh, this compass, it turns out, functions also with polarized light E vectors, which you'd expect for an animal, um, any animal that does any kind of navigation outside. Uh, the sun cues are the way to go. And if you're making a 3000 kilometer journey like the monarch butterfly, maybe you don't want to fly too much on cloudy days. But if you did, having polarized light uh, E vectors guide you is a great way to do maintain your bearings. Um, you can use wind direction as well, it turns out. And this is from Rachel Wilson's lab. So essentially multiple kinds of cues that we now know at the level of uh, identifying their individual ring neuron populations, not all, but most of them. This figure, uh, this particular plot is represents a matrix where you don't need to again read off the names. What I want you to take away is each row, each sort of block of rows represents a particular class of ring neurons that carries a particular type of uh, input to the compass system. And the EPGs are down below here. So every pixel, the row represents the inputs from a particular class of ring neurons or a particular ring neuron onto a particular EPG neuron. That's a single pixel. And that's the EPG, uh, the uh, ring neurons on the left. Uh, on uh, Those are the rows and the EPG neurons are the columns, okay? What Hannah Haberkan in the lab did was actually look at uh, the patterns of connectivity here and she picked out some fairly interesting features of this. So one feature is you can already see there's darker and lighter areas here. So not all ring neurons have equally strong numbers of synapses. So here it's we're, we're calculating relative contributions of numbers of synapses onto the EPG neurons. They're not all the same. Some are dark like here, some are light like here. And in addition, so that's one thing. So different inputs, um, different kinds of ring neuron inputs are differently strong onto the EPG neurons. They have more or less, we think, control of the compass representation. Secondly, um, if you look at a matrix of connectivity between the ring neurons themselves, so ring neuron to ring neuron now, you see lots of these blocks around the diagonal. So it turns out the ring neurons are connected all to all between themselves as well, okay? So what does that give you? This all to all inhibition we think gives you stimulus selection. So if you have a bunch of cues, you pick the good ones, the strong ones survive or they alternate depending on the kind of dynamics in the network. But basically the stronger cues survive and the weaker ones are suppressed. So you can get noise suppression through this kind of uh, network. Finally, you'll notice there are some off-diagonal elements in this as well, off-diagonal blocks in this matrix as well. And so we think the off-diagonal elements allow one class of ring neurons to essentially suppress another class if they're both simultaneously active. 
So if you're thinking in terms of Q conflict experiments or Q conflict in general, you have multiple cues trying to tell you different things about which direction you're pointed. In the flies case, we think there are prescribed rules that suggest that are based both on the amount of input each class of neurons has to the EPG neurons represented here by these different size blobs on, on uh, uh, the y-axis. Uh, and further, if you look in, for example, this red box down below on the left, you'll notice uh, one off-diagonal uh, block is, is dark and the other off-diagonal element is light. And that suggests to us one class of neurons essentially inhibits the other class if they're both active. So essentially, you have a hierarchy of cues coming into this compass system where there's flexibility, um, but within class, there's inhibition that creates stimulus selection so that the strongest ones survive. And further, if there are multiple cues available, the ones that we think are most global, like the polarized light cues, the sun compass cues, tend to be stronger and dominate over other ones that might be more transiently useful to compute head direction. All right, so that's summarizing how, in some sense, Network architecture, this all-to-all -all connections, um, et cetera, uh, actually buy you quite a bit in terms of saying, well, flexibility should ideally be in these locations. And so that's something that you know, we think is, is wonderful as a combination of structure that says certain things are prioritized with flexibility that says, well, you can adapt to different scenes as well. But now we're going to drift into something uh, even more general. So can you take these bumps of activity, which some of you are already thinking in terms of this, uh, for vector computations. Can you use them for vector computations? Because essentially what I told you about how you move the bump um, you know, from its original location in darkness, if the fly turns one way or the other to a new location, I basically talked about bump math. I had you know, one bump here and another bump there. And, and with some summation, you essentially can do vector math in principle. So is there evidence for that at all in uh, these creatures? Well, I'll take the ant as our classic example. So the ant, of course, is well known to have this behavior where desert ants, even in surroundings with very few visual features to help them, they'll go off on uh, some kind of foraging trip. And then when they're done foraging and they wanna head back home, they can make a straight path back home using path integration to do their computations. If you think about it, what's effectively happening though is they are summing vectors all along the way. They're walking in some direction for a while, they're walking in some other direction. So they take their traveling direction, how far they've walked in that direction, they're measuring that. And then eventually with vector math, like you would uh, potentially think anyway, um, they're computing the vector back home. And so this has been sketched out by many people in models, um, but it turns out flies have a version of this as well. So essentially flies, as I showed you in uh, Hannah's assay, as well as in those from the Dickinson and Brockman labs, uh, flies basically have the ability to go off on foraging trips and make their way back. Not the same kind of uh, trajectory that you're seeing here, but still keeping track of direction and distance. And this is not the only kind of vector compute computations that flies need to do. Remember flies' head movements, um, they can pitch, they can roll, they can yaw. And so if they can do that, anytime they're trying to make a decision about where to move based on visual information, they'd need to know something about the head body angle to move in the right direction. If they just have a hardwired thing there of one particular thing for a, uh, for a particular, you know, without taking into account head body angles, you'd end up with a, a mess of a navigator. And so there's multiple different ways in which coordinate transformations require potential vector computations, path integration based strategies to get home and to uh, you know, figure out how far away you are from home, need vector math. Well, so how do you do vector math? Uh, David Turetsky in a lovely little paper uh, in the 90s uh, and, and many others besides have pointed out that actually it's really convenient to have a population of neurons essentially represent, have activity like a sinusoid to carry out vector math. You can do phaser-based representations with this and essentially combine vectors pretty easily and get back a new sinusoid to represent you know, the sum or, or if you're doing uh, subtraction, you can do that too, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really conducive for doing trigonometry in the brain to have sinusoidal representations in, in your populations of neurons. And well, when Dan looked at this, he, found that indeed you do have these kinds of sinusoids reinforced. And this is something that was also noted by Gabby Mehman's lab, um, also looking through the connectome. What they also noticed is uh, in independent work, if you look at the connectivity between this, these EPG neurons, the compass neurons, and these so-called delta-7 neurons that are inhibit that are glutamatergic neurons uh, that arborize in this protocerebral bridge structure, if you look closely at this connectivity and you align based on all the EPG inputs. So essentially, you're taking the diagonals out and kind of just linearizing that bit. If you look at this, what you get back is essentially 
a sinusoid. You get you can fit it really well with a cosine. So the total number of synapses um, that the EPGs make, the EPG populations make onto the delta seven neurons across uh, different parts of the protocerebral bridge. Well, you get a really nice sinusoid. So if you run activity through this pattern that's even not sinusoidal, it pops back out as a sinusoid. Uh, you know, thanks to the recurrent connections. And so we think this entire we and, and Gabby Memon's lab as well think that this basically makes you a beautiful vector com uh, computer in, in the fly brain. And so for the last bit of this talk, I'm going to tell you why that's cool. So uh, think of this these two bumps of activity in the protocerebral bridge. Again, these bumps think of as, as kind of representing phasers or, or uh, population patterns of sinusoidal activity that you can use to combine in different ways to uh, compute different things. And now, uh, if we looked at a new structure called the fan-shaped body now, which I introduced to you earlier, different classes of neurons there have different phase shifts, just like the PN neurons did earlier. The PN neurons, you'll remember, came to either side of the central structure. This is originally an anatomical observation that Tanya Wolf, uh, an, a fabulous anatomist in uh, Genelia, made that both, again, Gabby Memon's lab and ours both immediately saw the potential to, to, do, to move the bump around. Well, but the same logic holds in the fan-shaped body. You have um, essentially two bumps in the protocerebral bridge. They come down into the fan-shaped body. They could either arrive at exactly the same location in the fan-shaped body, um, or if they are slightly, if the projection patterns are slightly shifted relative to each other, you could get back two bumps. Instead of you know, them combining to make one, you get two. And now we're back playing that same game depending on what kinds of information you feed into those two neurons, you have a little basis set of two vectors um, where you can represent you know, where the population activity is one of these vectors. You can, with asymmetries in the left and right populations, you can basically do a little bit of vector math. And indeed, it turns out, thanks to work from our lab, but um, published work from multiple other labs, including Kathy Nagel's lab, uh, Hokuto Kazama's lab, and before that even, um, Stanley Heinze's lab, there's self-motion input and optic flow input uh, coming in through a, a different structure of the central co complex called the noduli into this system so that these neurons, these neurons that project from the protocerebral bridge to the fan-shaped body with these different um, phase shifts, they do get self-motion information that creates this asymmetry, not the same kind of self-motion information, different kinds of self-motion self information than just the simple turning information. And so we think this creates the wonderful opportunity to do, for example, head body co coordinate transforms, because all you need is you know, to know one angle, and then you can compute from the head body angle combined with the head direction cell input, you can get back the body direction. Or you could say, I have a head direction input, and I bring in efferent input, which we think comes into these neurons as well, into some subpopulations of these neurons, and you can get back uh, you can compute where you're going to go next. So it's like a forward model based uh, kind of thing. If you want to do that, you could potentially compute that. And ultimately, uh, one of the magical things is we think there might be enough there for a four vector basis set based purely on the connectivity. So not just two vectors now, now we're talking about four vectors. And the reason is the fan shape body also has these neurons that have particular phase shifts within the fan shape body. So it's all about phase shifts here, except in this case, these horizontal cells, they're called horizontal because they move their arbors uh, are uh, span parts of the fan-shaped body. Different columns in the fan-shaped body uh, are associated with different phase shifts, uh, roughly. And, and basically, these horizontal H delta cells span those columns in very particular ways that give you a 180-degree phase shift. The V delta neurons, on the other hand, give you a zero-degree phase shift. You combine these guys, and what you can get is taking some particular combination of vectors well, depending on the kind of uh, 180 degree shift neuron, whether it's excitatory or inhibitory, you can create a, a new set of vectors that's basically 180 shifted from the original one and effectively get four vectors now, different subpopulations representing uh, these different vectors. And you can compute quite arbitrary things such as, um, for example, traveling direction. So this is something we independently saw in the connectome but then with physiology was noted by Gabby Memon's lab, Cheng Liu in Gabby's lab, and Jenny Liu in, in Rachel Wilson's lab in, in a collaboration there. Uh, the first one with Larry Abbott and the second uh, with, involving Shaul Druckmann. And so uh, what, what's beautiful here is that the system actually sets up for you a four vector basis set to compute your arbitrary traveling direction based on, you know, you could translate, you could be moving forward, you could be turning, whatever else, and, and basically you get a four vector basis set. Okay, in the very last piece, I'm going to just 
dwell briefly on how you have flexibility even beyond this. So in the assay that I introduced to you earlier, that Chantal in my lab is doing, the fly is learning in a visual environment to associate particular parts of the visual scene with good and other parts with bad. Um, thanks to analysis done primarily by Anne, uh, we found that in fact, what they uh, actually change about their behavior is the duration that they fixate in different parts of the visual scene and the direction that they saccade with what probability, the probability of saccading in this direction or that direction in different parts of the visual scene. In minutes, in four minutes of this exposure to the laser, they learn this and they, their behavior starts getting structured in ways that they avoid the bad parts and they go to the good parts. Our model for how this is done relies, of course, on uh, insights in the connectome, but it has one key element that I think is really rather cool. And that is that this entire behavior operates on the goal heading. So it's basically you're shifting around a goal heading and the behavioral patterns of like how you turn to get to that goal heading or how you um, you know, maintain fixations longer at that goal heading, all that comes for free. So in the parlance of, uh, you know, ML, basically you have a policy that is um, fixed in some sense, but it's a flexible policy. The form, of, I'm sorry, the form of the policy is fixed, but the policy is super flexible in terms of being able to move this goal heading anywhere. It's just that all the rest of it, the turning and everything, you don't need to explore the space of turns and explore the space of fixations every time. All you need to specify is where am I going? And I know how to get, I know to implement a policy that gets me there. And that again, the trick involves phase shifts, of course. There's uh, neurons with a 180 degree phase shift. There's neurons with a 90 degree phase shift um, that very particularly can give you exactly the kind of thing with the same bump map, with the same vector computation. I encourage you to check out uh, Chuntao and Ayan's paper uh, if you want more on that. Um, but the bottom line for me is like you have a system where you can set goals thanks to a variety of different uh, inputs coming in from different structures that's based on hunger, that's based on punishments, that's based on odor, as Kathy Nagel's lab has shown. Um, they come into this network, this deeply recurrent network, set the fly potentially goals. Uh, and this is work that, by the way, I should be very careful to clarify. Some of these are still not experiments that have proven these things. They're, this is connectome-based logic combined with some physiology from multiple labs uh, work. And so what we think is, is really powerful about this is you have a system where the architecture is deeply meaningful. The cell types are deeply meaningful and help you understand how the computations are carried out. But it's an insanely flexible system and a very powerful one for doing all kinds of stuff. So um, that's the kind of puzzle we work with. My, I will leave you with one slightly provocative statement, perhaps, which is I, I thought the panel discussion tomorrow is kind of amusing because it seems to cast as contrast understanding how the brain com computes and whether that should be understood or whether we should focus on understanding learning. And of course, the answer to me is obviously both. Uh, suggesting that one has to choose suggests that either one is looking very transiently at very large networks that are artificial or in systems where you don't have good access yet to cell types and connectivity and so on uh, that allow you to make sense of what you're seeing uh, fully. Um, but I think in the long run, things are gonna work out in the direction of being able to do both. Of course, it's important to know about objective functions and learning rules. But it's also important, I think, uh, to understand how the computations are carried out because evolution gives you a ton of structure that makes that easy. All right, speaking of structure that makes things easy, um, we have a rich, rich uh, ecosystem within Genelia that uh, my lab thrives in and a fantastic array of collaborators. I've mentioned them by name a few times already. Um, I will just again point out Hannah, Brad, Johannes, uh, who's now at Max Planck, Sang Su, who's now at UC Santa Barbara, I should have said as a, has his own lab there, Dan Turner Evans, now uh, at UC Santa Cruz. So these folks did a bunch of the connectome work and the original EPG uh, imaging work. Uh, again, all of this wouldn't have been possible without tons of help from tons of colleagues. Uh, I'm gonna end by also asking you to visit someday when uh, this Greek, Greek alphabet soup thing stops and we're not at Omicron and deltas and whatever else. We have lots of cool stuff happening there, so please come. And we have positions at Genelia if you want if you want to work in uh, cognitive neuroscience, but from a mechanistic perspective, in either fish or flies. All right. We also have rodents, but we're primarily focusing this hiring round on fish or flies. All right. With that, thank you very much. I'll take questions. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna make some I'm gonna make some clapping noises on behalf of everyone who I'm sure are clapping. Thank you, ben. Um, in, in their pl places around at least two others amongst the 631 who are clapping as well. <laughs>
<laughs> oh, there's some beautiful work. Um, I, I, if I didn't already have some collaborators on flies, I think I would be look, looking for some right now. Um, so there are some questions that have accumulated in the questions. Um, as I'm giving people a little bit of time to, to go look at those, um, and, and we can pick some from, from those for Vivek to discuss, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a question. Um, I don't know if this is more of a philosophical question or not. It's about, um, I'm curious what you think about the fact that you've already had a lot of these structural insights from the fly connectome knowing that you haven't yet gotten every single synapse between every neuron and every other neuron. How crucial do you think that is? Do you think we need that? Do you think we need that in the fly? If we wanted to have the same types of insights between computational learning, let's say in a mammalian system, do we need that? Or do you think, do you no. think we don't? No, I mean, I, I would say that a lot of our insights are based on knowing just who connects to who with roughly what strength, with uh, what motif, basically it's pulling out motifs. If you have a combination of cell types and motifs, and cell types I'm defining very loosely here, right? It's not some mm -hmm. golden definition that I want to get into an argument about. It could be just an operational definition. And I understand there's heterogeneity when you're talking about, say, a hippocampal cell type, uh, and it can drift and all that. But in a local sense, if you have some concept of what a cell type is that's operationally useful and you can target it genetically, I think it's actually sufficient to have a notion of what the motifs are, uh, you gain more insight from having the weight information. And of course, in a learning situation, it, it, the, the learning may not even be in structural ways that you kind of can measure the size of the synapse, although there are reports that you can do that, but right. it may be you know, some subcellular thing that gives you the, the, the learning. So you, it may not be measurable with EM anyway. So I think it's more knowing the motifs, knowing the cell types, knowing the polarity of those connections, the neurotransmitters, Put that pieces to put those pieces together and i think that it makes for tons of insight already and of course you can get more and more but that's already enough i think and that seems achievable in many systems in the long term okay thank you um i'm going to take some questions from from the audience um this one is from noah petit and it's been uploaded a few times and they're asking how much is the representation of the angular velocity calibrated by visual feedback from the environment as opposed to being hardwired it's a, that's a really good question. Um, so, hi Noah. Uh, I, I know we were supposed to talk independent of this at some point. Um, so, uh, it's it's so there's these neurons that uh, Brad House in my lab is looking at right now called GLNO neurons. I didn't have time to tell you about them, but they send their inputs to uh, the nodulus. The structure that I was saying creates these asymmetries in velocity uh, information that eventually allows the bump to move one way or the other uh, because of this vector computation stuff that I was telling you about and the phase shift. So these neurons actually take in information that we think uh, is like proprioceptive or efferent as well as optic flow information. And uh, Brad has done experiments where he's changed the gain of the system. So essentially the fly is in closed loop walking on the ball, but now when it turns 30 degrees, the visual world moves by let's say 60 degrees or by 15 degrees. And he asks, what is the angular velocity estimate that you get in that situation? Well, mm -hmm. if the fly is walking, so if there is self-motion information, that rules. So basically, if the fly is walking and it's turning in one direction, then it overwhelms whatever the wrong optic flow information is telling it. However, if it's not moving and the world moves, uh, then the op angular velocity information tends to take in whatever, um, you know, whatever it's getting from the optic flow. So basically, what's marvelous is it's sort of like it trusts itself when it has that information available to it when it's turning but it also takes in uh, the optic flow information. And so we're kind of working out the logic of that in terms of the circuit, um, but it's kind of cool how the system, you know, kind of deals with that, with, with those kinds of inconsistencies. If the question is broader and you're asking, could I just change the game to something arbitrary and create virtual worlds like that? Um, like say, for example, in Misha Aranz's case in the fish where, you know, you could subject the fly to a particular kind of closed loop gain and then ask how long it lasts and it lasts several seconds beyond and so on. Uh, in this system, we think if the fly is moving, that that basically rules. I mean, the, the bump will move based on that, even if you screw up the world around it and give it like weird gains. This, I, I think this is related to another question um, about, uh, again, about multisensory integration, which we've already talked a little bit about. Um, and the, the question from uh, Shu Lu Sung is about whether or not you think this multisensory integration is winner take all, is there some optimality to it, or is it is it something else? So this is, I mean, so uh, Shilong, I mean, I, I'm assuming he's thinking in terms of olfactory because he has cool work on on how the olfactory uh, input might 
interact with other input. Um, so the best data I know of is is unpublished, but I've heard it in talks. It, it, it involves uh, mechanosensory input and visual input, and that's from Rachel Wilson's lab. And so uh, I don't want to talk too much about their work, but but you know I think it's an open question that they're kind of very much interested in investigating. Kathy Nagel's looked at sort of olfactory input as the cue. Um, we've personally, my lab has kind of looked more at uh, self motion and and um, visual input, and and those are not really the kinds of cues that are contrasted in the way that you're talking about. Um, if I had to guess. Uh, and, and I'm really not using work that I know of uh, when I say this, I'm using purely the connectome. There is some element of like certain hierarchies are imposed on the system. I mean, that's what we would predict from the connectivity that certain types of information dominate over others. Um, I don't know if it's winner take all or winners take all and creating confusion where there's there's kind of, uh, you know, you kind of get to middle representations between different kinds of cues. Um, do you ever, I do you ever see their- Basel L. Yundi's work in the, sorry, last, but, uh, Basil El Yundi's work in uh, the dung beetle when he was with Marie Dacker because they looked at this stuff too and it was really cool and they were looking at Q combinations. So it's not fly work, but that's that's where you'd see some of the answers. Do you see that there is is there ever any context dependence, for example, depending on some other internal or external yes. state of the animal? Okay. Absolutely. I mean, there, there's tons of that in the system. I mean, the same brain structures are involved in things like sleep and hunger dependent sort of foraging strategies and a whole more a whole bunch of things besides i mean this what's what's marvelous about this little thing is of course when you look closely and you know my colleague Kristen branson is one of those who looks closely at these things now with like monitoring what their movements are actually i mean you see so much richness there just dismissing them as small little things to be ignored would be a real mistake they have pretty you know wonderful lives themselves and they need to do lots of things uh, using their sense of where they are and how their body parts are situated relative to the world around them, you know, so, yeah. Um, so there's a question earlier on from Alfonso Martin Pena, uh, who noticed that the example fly that you had was female. I was wondering if you have any found any sex differences in your data. Uh, we have not. I mean, this is embarrassing to admit, but uh, we've been kind of uh, using the female flies almost exclusively. Uh, we have tried male flies a couple of times and, and they don't, the compass system looks about the same. So his models uh, of ring attractors will look about the same, I think, uh, and his robots should be, I mean, uh, equally valid for whether they're modeling female or male flies. I think uh, I'm speaking specifically about the questioner, uh, but I think that ultimately there's no uh, way to know other than to actually do the experiments. I won't say more than that. I, to, the, to, to date, we haven't seen anything dramatically different. Wonderful. Okay, there's actually a ton more questions, uh, but I, I have been I have been tasked with keeping us on schedule, and so so I'm going to, on behalf of all the organizers in the audience, thank Vivek again for a wonderful talk. It was, frankly, I mean I've seen pieces of this before, but I, I every time I hear about it, it's it's still mind blowing every time. So we're so thank delighted you. that you were able to to join us, um, and for thank you for, for all those the questions who... as well, and thanks for the chat responses. And I'd love to continue the conversation, but I don't know how to do that. Can I continue it on the chat, or how does? Yeah, absolutely. So the questions, this like... event will actually remain here, and um, if you felt like answering some of the questions, this. All this... right, I'll just go to that, and I'll sure I, I can do that. But thank you oh, again I'm for asking really the questions, and thank you, Bing. All right, everyone else in the audience, you'll be uh, pulled into the next session automatically.